There we go. Chatting to Anna Noel in Anna's studio. So can we explore a little bit about how you came to be a maker, a ceramic maker? Did you find yourself making things early on in your life? Yes, well, um, well, I came from a, I come from an artistic family. My father being an architect, my mother being a painter. So from quite an early age, um, for a mother, I always was making things, painting or just, just making things because um, she would run little art classes for children mm. and we were little paper mache animals and mm. my heads and all sorts of things, puppets and things like that um, and and she would make toys for um, a local uh, shop my, my, a, a, like a um, design shop that my father and mother had in, in Swansea because they didn't like the designs in in um, what was happening in the shop, so they were the first people who started to bring over Scandinavian design things. Oh, yeah. Even before um, it was Conrad, you know, they um, yes. had them um, a habitat. So they had a pre habitat habitat in Swansea in probably the late 50s, early 60s. Oh, interesting. So, um, wow. so, uh, so, so, you made toys mm. for out of you know, um, there for, as well for Christmas time and things. So, house was always full of things and mm. painting, and she would paint us. <laughs> and paint everything else. <laughs> um, so yes, I was I was just surrounded by art and making mm. from from oh, well, not knowing not knowing when it wasn't happening. No, really. exactly. So I suppose it was also almost a bit inevitable that um, some of us, us children would end up doing mm. art. But obviously, something you always but enjoyed. Yes, you and became... I think it's, it's also when I was young, I had. Um, Hearing problems, so often um, the glue ear, bad case of mm. glue, glue ear, which wasn't spotted till I was much late, early, late, about seven or so, eight, something that like seven. Mm. So I think it was a way of me expressing myself as well was through art. I was just, I just um, loved making. I just mm. so whether that had anything to do with the fact that my communication skills was better in visual than than speaking, because mm. I was probably a bit slower in catching up with normal speaking and um, communicating and, word and writing things. I think it's because of my mother's influence mm. more than anything else, I thought. And did you find yourself leaning towards enjoying using one material more than others um, early on? I did or? started doing ceramics. first time I had did ceramics was or anything like that was when I was... Um, I think somebody bought some for Christmas, some of these self-hardening clay, and I just, I just made a little head. And I just, the first time I've touched anything like that, and I just loved it. <laughs> and ever since then, I just been making things in clay, mm. <laughs> real clay, out there mm. after, after that. Have but, you still uh, got it? I have actually got it. So this, this first little head I made when I was, I think I was about 12 or 13. Oh thing, uh, but um, then I did O-level in pottery, ceramics, and then when it was foundation time, you had to choose which, which um, course you had to do. I just instinctively went towards ceramics. How about nature? Have you always has there been a long standing sort of close association or interest in nature and uh, natural? Um, yes, yeah, so I, th- I think I've always been particularly. Um, yeah, I, th- I think I think I would like again living on the Gower. I always got walks on, on, on the cliffs and just like like watching, seeing what you could see, and having a dog. I was a little growing up. Mm-hmm. My my companion and having cats at home. Yes, I, th- I think you just automatically bond with with animals and they become your companions. And when I was in school, I was I didn't have some friends to play with because I was living away from other kids. So my companions were my was was my dog and mm-hmm. the cats. Very early empathy with that. Yes, I think I think that was that was part. Of, I think if, if I had lived in a normal street where there's kids playing around, I was you just open your door and then you could be your next door neighbour had a kid you can play with, perhaps it would have been different. But mm. but the fact that you need a companion, I just sort of had my dog. Mm. <laughs> when I was younger, I was going to be the one that would, because I'd be, I would look after my younger sister and brother, and um, and I would have these stories in my head, and we would say, well, now we're going to go to Africa. <laughs> and in my father had all these collections of stuff he would get, and in the outbuildings we had mattresses stacked from top of furniture. So I found a way that we sat on this mattress and said, this is a magic carpet. And we go to Africa. How wonderful. <laughs> and so we sat and we found them in the box, all these old ancient hats that people, um, I think they must have been sold for on, the, on the beach. Some, had, some previous owner had them for them on the beach and so they must have been in the 30s. They were all these really weird hats that looked a bit, a bit like um, lampshades. <laughs> 
put the one ahead and we'd be in another country. Mm-hmm. And then the, the driveway became the river Orinoco and we would mm-hmm. pretend to be rafting down it and um, and having been... So I, so I would have to tell stories and then there would be characters in my story how to tell them who they were. Sterling Tony stories was what I did to entertain my brother and sister. So telling stories from um, from very early I was on quite young and make believe. Oh yes, as I, well, could, I could go know. right into that world, mm. and, 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 and then they would be arguing. So I would be, always be the this is my story. Yeah, I would make my role more interesting. So my sister would would say, "Mother, it's not fair." But Anna's always a princess, and she has all the adventures. And I said, well, "Let's say I'll be the princess." Okay, hmm. I'll be the prince. The princes are having all the adventures. It's not fair. <laughs> and I think, well, it's your story. You don't fit yourself doing the hmm. interesting stuff. So, so hmm. yeah, still telling stories and and, and <laughs> that's what I did. It's quite ingrained. I think it, I just, yeah. I just said something I used to do. I would often. When I was older, when my brothers did not need me anymore for these walks, for these event stories, I would go off in my own and scare myself sometimes. I would go off in a walk and say, there are wolves here. <laughs> and before I knew it, I just, I got myself so carried away in my own imagination that I believed that there were dangers in this, <laughs> in this little wood and walk through and um, with my dog and, and come scurrying home thinking, hmm... <laughs> Feeling a bit of an idiot, but also, um, but anyway, it's quite, I quite enjoyed being scaring myself, got from my little stories. Yeah, well, it's wonderful to have the freedom to do to do that, really, and allow yourself to do that. And all the make believe stories. Did you find them um, again early on, sort of infiltrating and influencing what you were making, or was it all? Is it I all don't think not so. Not at that stage. No, I think it was more just. In my head, I would. I don't mm. think I found a way to express it. Mm. Perhaps even I think I'm starting to express it now than when I was younger. But, um, I think skills and understanding of the material and things like that just take time to come in. But um, but I perhaps I did not realise that, that I this desire of telling stories was something that was in me. Now finding a way to share and express those. And yes, I think mm. it just take. Yeah. I think, um, I thought like things just to be slightly other and slightly quirky and not straightforward as description of this is a cat, this is a dog. It would make it slightly... Alternative. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Interesting. And so the stories, fables, narratives that you find yourself exploring now, some of them are of your own making, but a lot are responding to other people's words as well. Mm. aren't they are there any and, and there's some um rhymes i suppose that you use repeatedly there's others that maybe you use one off are there any sort of favored um writers or words that you find yourself returning to time and time again well i have used um edward lear frequently because of his is the his images and he does lots with people and animals and they're so sort of quirky, and I think also think they're very British, the sort of eccentricness that, and they do reflect the sort of childhood. Anything could happen, and it's and it's sort of you can believe someone could ride a tiger or ride a pig, and and it's perfectly normal <laughs> to do it the way. But when adults were thinking, no, you wouldn't. It's too messy. <laughs> you know? um, I think that's probably what um, um, I like about that sort of innocent world of of childhood. But um, it really seems to conjure up mm. that possibility. Yes, and it, yes. Mm. But they, and some of the animals that Leah references and that you're making are not are obviously not indigenous to Britain. Mm. They're quite exotic animals, yes. whereas others that you're making are very well local and inhabit mm. the woods around you. But so, do you, are you conscious of that breadth, if you like, of sort of interest in animals and different cultures, all influences um. or? Well, I think, I mean, certainly, obviously, a lot of exotic animals are part of our storytelling as children. We get coming I mean, so with tigers and lions and wolves, and are obviously, but I think we were, were told them. And um, I, th- I think it's the idea that, that you could ride a tiger is it's something, you know, oh, it's quite a sort of um, impossible thing to happen. And I just, I like this as the um, ambiguity or just the, um, the idea, I think the idea is, is, is like um, someone riding a tiger with tiger tiger wood in bright. Because it's like, I thought like a, like a dream, a nighttime dream. And it's sort of, that's why a person's lying on it. 
thinking it's um it's yeah so because i mean it's, it's like symbolic of what you can do when you when you dream you, you can be anywhere and go anywhere and riding a line it, it, it could symbolize something fantastic or wonderful or, or something scary but also i think when i was younger my father would he would take us to these old houses and um, i remember one house to go to this ancient house and had all these lion these uh, tiger skins on the floor and I think and I think all these sort of exotic sort of quite sort of <laughs> strange places that we used mm-hmm. to go the ancient houses that we're thinking I think some of these animals images these stuffed animals Victorian houses either all mix up in your mind mm-hmm. and they become part of of um because then you wonder through this wild garden then because if we let we left to roam around the garden as children and so the idea of the you remember what you remember you remember the tiger remember the garden mm-hmm. so suddenly they all become muddled up together and you know, then, yeah there were tigers in the garden mm. Mm. sort of thing so creative um, melting pot yes really. mm. as the child muddles up things when they've seen yeah puts them together in a rather strange way but does that make sense as a child mm. so the way you put people and animals together now is that much more of a conscious um or conscious approach to how to the relationship you build between the people and animals or is it something that unfolds as you're making say all not all but but most of the people and animals together in your work seem to have a very calm sense of being together (laughs) sort of equanimity (laughs) i like that uh, uh, idea of the moment because sometimes when you of a moment of calm there's sometimes when you when you like when you look and you're in a field or you see a horse or a bull and you've got the moment you're looking and it's just that's the moment of contact mm. that this is this, there is a peace and a calm and you're both looking at each other and, and you're sussing each other out and, but after that it could be anything that mm. happened you know it could go either way yeah. <laughs> yes so I just I, I just think that's something maybe you just maybe it's just the moment of of um, of, of an animal turning his head and looking at you and thinking right I've seen you Mm. And then you're looking at them and thinking, shall I run? Mm. Um, yeah, I like that. I didn't want them to feel that they're, that either is, is a sort of, um, is a, a control of each other. I just wanted that sort of balance of maybe just um, of the, yeah, the the animal and, har- and the harmony of the animal and person at that moment in time. And, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Equality in terms of, yes. But it doesn't mean it's necessarily... Because once you said that this line is good, you you said it, and once you, or it's just like you know, once you said that the line has pounced and it's going to attack you, mm. you know what's going to happen. But because you don't, it's like, just like the moment when you look at a bull in the field and, mm. and it's and it's beautiful and fierce, look, but it's calm. And it, it, but it could be, <laughs> you'd be over the hedge in a second. It's just that moment, and sometimes I think sometimes that moment is quite powerful. That really intense stare. Between the animal and you. Yes, just weighing each other out or yeah. getting a sense of possibility. Yes. Mm. Well, which could be from a cat, a dog, um, horse, any kind of animal. You're in their consciousness and they, you're in your sort of thing. So, mm. moment of two spirits. So, would you say, thinking about that, of, of capturing a moment and then so many alternative scenarios could unfold from that moment, would you say that your pieces? Maybe some of them you're presenting a sense of um, possibility to people and to viewers to then let their own stories unfold yeah, in their people, own Yeah, I think that, that, that's what I... When I've heard people, how they respond to the work, I, I'm surprised people, they do tend to tell their own stories about things, which I like. Then I tell them, like I was telling you about the email of this chap who went to the, the lion, the man riding the lion, and he was saying symbolise his courage to him, which I actually thought about, but thinking, yeah, I can imagine you thinking, if you can ride a line, then you've conquered the world, sort of thing. Mm. So it's like symbolic, so people were, and some people say, I put this in a certain place in my house and, and you know, it reminds me of this or it makes me smile or something like that. And people do t- often tell me that they they tell themselves a story about about them afterwards, which is which means that there there's a there is a um, a relationship going on with them and the piece. And after I've left it, and it's their t- it's their story. Then it's like me when I was younger, telling my brother and sister the story and, and carrying on in their heads their story. Because sometimes now my brother even now tells the story that when he was young, he went to Africa. <laughs> Carpet, you know, sort of thing. So it's sort of thinking. Gosh, he still he was reminded. So he still is in his memory of this adventures he had. Mm-hmm. Well, what it was was a 
shed full of old furniture mm-hmm. and a driveway and they went travel the world but it was very real <laughs> how you all inhabited that world yeah so so that's what i think they bring people by the people maybe they do carry on their own stories and i think that i think it's nice when people i always get quite chuff people tell me their stories or what the pieces mean to them and those people and people's relationships with animals there's such a variety. Well, always so different, aren't they? Different in different cultures, obviously, and with different experiences. But you do get a sense from people, from us, that that for many people you can be very honest with animals. Mm. That sort of um, sense of being able to be oneself. Yes. And again, and again, the relationships that you offer with the figures and the animals in your work, there's that sense of well, at ease. But would you say? That's something where you reference through your childhood, being very at ease with animals and companionship. And so that's that sense of being oneself and being honest in an animal's company. <laughs> Is that something that you bring to your work that you're aware of or you consider through your making? Or, or I don't think I really? do. I don't do it consciously. No. I, I, just, I just like animals as, as sort of characters and forms and and I've always been more attracted to that as you know as a sculptural idea and thing and then you know just combining things together I think it's just a um you know, the worry of just the construction comes mm-hmm. into the mm-hmm. into a big issue how do you make a make a figure stand on the hill not falling off and breaking <laughs> it's if, if that's kind of more of an issue then then too many complicated things because it's yeah. the um it's the technical thing that I tend, tend sometimes do tend to take over, and then hopefully at the end you're thinking, gosh, hope it has worked. It's really interesting you say that because looking at your work, obviously it's so it's well it's become so accomplished in technique, and there's a there's such a simplicity of line, if you like, and a strength of technique. So is is that something that you can that you're continually working on and challenged by? Um, or have you found particular ways of knowing that legs are going to be safe on hills so that you can just enjoy making that leg? <laughs> well, not a degree, but I think, yeah, you try and try and make very simple. A lot of first thing that I've simplified, that's why I like folk art, because they, where they could make, rather than, you know, any a horse person would think, that's not a horse <laughs> They don't do that. Where are the knees? Where is this? I think, well, if I did that, then you end up being too fiddly with that kind of stuff. And I think you use the dynamism of the form and the shape. Mm. So I just try to simplify it, hopefully. That still resembles the spirit and the form of the horse, mm. hopefully. Without being bogged down with, with getting everything anatomically correct. Because, um, because as I said, when you look at folk art, it's not anatomically correct, and it's more me more powerful than a, when I look at a realistic model of a horse. I find that a bit dull because it's, it says everything. Mm. That's a miniature horse, but it hasn't got anything else to say. So perhaps the fact that a, a horse person will be annoyed, <laughs> they've got something to say at least. But somebody else may like me, who perhaps like folk art, they will, will understand. <laughs> A bit, maybe they think, thinking, oh, right, it's like a, a child to make it or something like that, and then, and then just accept it as it is, maybe. I think what you, you get coming out of them is the is character, mm. because your focus is on expressing a horse rather than copying a horse, mm. if you like, yeah. then then yes, that's, that's characters come through very powerfully, maybe, because of that. Do you, do you find you do a lot of line drawing, paper... Paper, not, pencil drawing. Not too much. I find it easiest to go straight to the clay because mm. it's well. The thing is, because it's a, it's a three D form, and if you sort of um, if you sort of work it out too much in two D, then sometimes you, it's it can hamper what you're doing in three D. With so I mean, you've got, you've got to see it as a whole. And so, so I find that um, I sort of do do sort of doodles roughly how to work out the image could look, and then I sort of see how it comes naturally in the clay. So you work it through with the medium. Yeah, I work it, yeah. Mm. I tend to work more in the medium then. But, I've, but I, also, I do try and work out the idea in my head or a very quick, quick doodle beforehand, but mostly just see how it happens. Was that the case sort of through learning and training that you'd always it's work just, immediately with the material or what did you find yourself working a lot through sketch pads, through sort of college days? And 
Well, yes, I, did, I think I did more cultural drawing, sketching, and I was a student trying to discover yourself and you know, to look at the, to go and look at a lot of dead out alleyways before you sort of figure out what, what you really are about, sort of thing. Royal College of Art, you were making animals there, yes, weren't yes, you? So yes, that's, yes. Yeah, I thought what happened, I, um, I did my first degree in Bath, yoga, you know, caution, mm. and um, initially I was doing a lot of circus things. Clowns. I couldn't figure out how to do animals. I wanted to do animals. I couldn't figure it out. And there's nobody telling me the techniques how to do it. Because if the legs and how to sport them tweaked after I'd finished that by putting a little prop underneath the legs, you can you can then have animals' legs and you can model around that. And when, it's, when the legs become firm enough, then you can move the prop and work on the rest of the animals. So it's a simple, very simple thing, but I had to work out for myself. I'm sure if I asked the tutors, maybe they would have come up with the solution, but but um, but it wasn't it wasn't obvious to me, and uh, so I struggled to, to find my way of expressing what I wanted to do um, in college, my first degree. So then I managed to have a few exhibitions run. I applied for our college, and then I carried. I wanted to. Uh, I felt my work was getting a bit sort of. It was limiting what I was doing, so it was a good thing to go there because it did make you had to really, really rethink how you're making and doing and going into more depth about why you're making animals, why you're doing what you're doing. So it made you think, what's well, your intellectual, intellectual rationale? So that made me think, and of course, I, I wasn't very good at expressing myself then, so um, it was, um, I think, it must be quite frustrating with me, but, <laughs> but um, it, it did make me think and made me have to think and think, why am I doing it? And I think that was that was a good time too, even though at times I was quite miserable because of, I couldn't think out the words, um, and I did not like London. Mm. It's um, far too city for me. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, but it was a good time too, important time to think mm. and think well, why why are you doing things? Sometimes it's easy to go on a, just on a, on a train and just carry on making and thinking, and I feel I think well everything becomes much an out rather than. Mm. So yeah, so my my making techniques changed and uh, and what kind of stuff, and so I think it's giving more freedom to do different, more wider range of stuff. And would you say that your work, that your practice, continues to develop naturally? Yeah, I think that's how I. Yeah, I think it's developing slowly. I think things change. New images come. I I think that maybe the confidence, maybe um, by looking really look at things, perhaps I could change some of the form. I think that's some of the other ones. And then also, you get bored with certain images, so you want to try new images. Hopefully, my skills got a bit better, so I can perhaps do things that I would have liked to have done earlier on. Maybe you're less fearful. You're less fearful of having yeah. it. Yeah, I think I think when you're in college, you've got you've got this sort of you've got your contemporaries pressure because they're doing all these wonderful mm-hmm. things. They think, oh. They're doing all these things. They know what to do, you know. And you just any sort of sort of things. So perhaps that makes you all self conscious and panicky. And when when you do, you only got no one else to see what everybody else is doing. And so you have to do it by yourself. A headspace, isn't it? And I think it's reflect. Yeah, I think it's time. Yeah. With me, I think I I seem to reflect better after a distance from the t- all the thoughts and the and the advice I had in college and and all the things you pick up. And then you realise, why did I think it then? No, what did I? But at the time, it was all like, like almost too much that I, you sort of store it in the back of your head and all of a sudden it's all coming through. And um, it's sort of, with me, it takes a bit of time for these... Just to filter through, yes, isn't yes. it? Just that filtering process and take years. Yes. <laughs> and have different resonances later on than yes. at the time. And You seem very, well, obviously... You're at home here. This is home and studio and in the most beautiful rural location surrounded, yes, by woodland and can sort of see almost audible, really. Do you imagine working, ever imagine working in any other environment? I don't think I'm very good at these things. Whenever I, like when I was in London, I was in that in that studio, bang, in the middle of London, I know Hyde Park across the road, but it's not not really countryside. I felt very claustrophobic, and it just did, did, did something to my head. To, to mm. almost, I had I couldn't work there. I stopped making anything clay. I think I don't know how to use clay anymore. I was looking at, it and I was panicking, so I had to come home. I made everything for my show at home, mm. and I brought it finished to the college because mm. I just. And I think that in the end, they these tutors understood, and they said, and they sort of. Even though we were worried at first where I work, where why wasn't I working in the college? I think they twigged that this. 
I couldn't I couldn't cope with all these people walking by and life going on. It just just does something to me. Mm-hmm. And being surrounded in, in a very small space, a claustrophobic space, it was just like I just totally panicked and I just and I found that I was I couldn't I couldn't use clay anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I went to America, that um, that two month workshop, I used, I started to panic then as well. It was in a the room with no view, no view. There's no mm-hmm. windows. And um, again, people were wandering around. I had this space. People were wandering around doing, doing their thing. And I just felt, oh, no, it's just something... I don't know what it is about that kind of environment that I just makes you feel very panicky. Mm-hmm. And um, so... Um, but other people flourish. Other people love it. And it's they sort of... They can cut everybody off and, and, and be any work anywhere. But it just seems to me important to be surrounded by nature. Mm. It's very different, and you've got natural light pouring in, and <laughs> so, you've got the sound of birds. Yes, I think that's. Outside. I think that's that's in. I think for me, I think I'm realising more and more that my environment is very important. Mm.